again, uh, my presentation today or my topic is really uh, positioned as a 101 as an introduction to that whole topic of the carbon credits and carbon markets with the focus on the food animal industry. Um, uh, again, introducing myself to those joining us late, I'm an assistant professor and extension specialist here at North Carolina State University, and I work primarily with uh, manure and uh, ag bioproduct uh, management and value re uh, recovery. And I'm starting with the, the term definitions, really, and my goal is to um, start with the kind of uh, demystifying the language around the carbon markets. And I'm starting with the term around the greenhouse. And this figure does a great job out of the NASA.gov office that captures, it's a, why we call it a greenhouse uh, gas or greenhouse effect, mainly because these specific gases have this impact on trapping gas in the atmosphere. Um, in such a way that all of the reflected solar radiation is reflected back in increased climate and atmospheric um, temperatures, causing uh, a heating or global warming. We call it primarily a carbon emissions or carbon emissions primarily because most of the greenhouse gases that are emitted from our economies or our countries generally are carbon. 80% uh, are carbon dioxide, 10% is methane, which is a carbon a gas along with hydrogen, but it's not exclusively carbon emissions. As you can see here, 6% of the greenhouse gas emissions by the US economy are nitrous oxide. That is a nitrogen and oxygen molecules, uh, oxidized nitrogen uh, molecule, uh, as well as higher uh, fluorinated and chlorinated uh, compounds. So really carbon came to be the term referring to all of the greenhouse gas emissions simply because of the mass contribution of carbon emissions to these gases. And here I want to pause and make the big distinction between what we call a short-lived carbon in the atmosphere, or we call it biogenic carbon, which is simply the carbon that is released when a plant tissue or uh, dies or essentially decomposes. It releases a carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide is short-lived in the plant and has been absor absorbed from the atmosphere within this growing cycle. That is in comparison to the long-lived carbon or the fossil carbon, that is the release of carbon that has been stored for millennia and is being released through the combustion of fossil fuels. That's the natural gas, that's the diesels and coal. So it, it's a very important distinction when we talk about the two uh, uh, forms of carbon emissions. And then when we talk about markets, it's important to talk about the global framework that a lot of the um, our uh, governments have since the early 90s, as you can see on that timeline, from a, an excellent review on United Nations frameworks, the focus was primarily on um, climate change. Um, and that's a forum and a series of conferences to address these emissions and to generate commitments by countries. As a matter of fact, the most recent conference on climate has just wrapped up in Egypt. So really, with all of these commitments and conferences globally, trading emissions is one of the main mechanisms that every um, state, region, or country, or continent puts into action these commitments to reduce emissions. And it is one of the ways to provide incentives to transition the economy to reducing these greenhouse gas emissions. So now that we've established the greenhouse gas the carbon and the markets terminologies, we start to come closer to what can what are these greenhouse gases? And again, it's primarily a carbon dioxide, uh, in addition to methane, nitrous oxide. But it's important for us, especially as uh, professionals in the agriculture industry, to understand the difference that not these gases are created equal. In other words, some are more potent than others. And this figure gives you a a, a great representation of that order of magnitude. In a way, a molecule of methane is 28 times as potent in the climate or the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. Nitrous oxide is 265 times as potent as a molecule of carbon dioxide. So really, carbon dioxide equivalent, or CO2E, that became the art stick to measure, the measure and benchmark greenhouse gases. So we'll be able to add them all together and count the greenhouse gas emissions consistently. Now, it's important to understand when we try to tackle these emissions, what are the biggest sources of these emissions? This figure on the right here does a great job of capturing 
the historical trend and on the horizontal axis, you will see years from 1990 to 2020, the past 30 years. And on the vertical axis, you can see the carbon dioxide equivalents in metric tons. So this figure does two things, really shows us the relative contribution by the industries or sectors in our economy, and also show us the trend over those 30 years. So you can see descending order from the largest contributor is transportation electricity generation and industry or manufacturing. Coming number four is agriculture around the 11%, then uh, residential and so on. But also you can see some arrows showing whether that sector has been trending upwards or downwards. So even though agriculture is not the top three, one of the top three economy sectors, it has been trending upwards over the past 30 years. And that's one of the reasons why we start to think about what role does agriculture play in the emissions as well as it can potentially play in the mitigation of these emissions. So when we look at this pie chart, which is basically the same, the representation of contribution of economy sectors to greenhouse gas, then we look on the right-hand side and look at methane in particular, we see a different story. We see that um, two circled in yellow, those two, uh, sectors or two sources of methane emissions put together make more than a third of the methane emissions from the U.S. economy. And those are related to animal agriculture specifically. Those are the enteric fermentation from uh, ruminants or um, cattle, uh, sheep, and goats, essentially from the digestion in the multiple stomachs that the animals have, as well as from the manure management or 9% of that methane come from manure management. So really we start to zoom in on the important contributions that animal agriculture make and opportunities for reduction. And when we shift our focus to nitrous oxide, we see even a more pronounced role for agriculture. We see 74% of the nitrous oxide, which again is 265 times as potent as carbon dioxide coming primarily from agricultural soil management, and a 5% of that is coming from manure management directly. And as we transition and come closer to the ag sector, this figure does a great job of capturing to us the cycle of agriculture, from the plant biomass, performing photosynthesis, absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to store in a biomass, and that carbon is harvested and then utilized or otherwise um, left in the field. We also see some of that carbon that is stored in the root systems and in the soils starts to create emissions directly to the atmosphere. We also see the contribution of animals directly from the animal emissions as well as from the manure. And when we start to look closer at the ag sector contributions to emissions, we see that soil and ag soil management is more than 50% of these emissions, while about 40% is split between the enteric emissions and the manure management. So we, we are seeing a, a very important areas for intervention in animal agriculture or in agriculture as a whole. We also see smaller contributions from urea and rice cultivation. And with the rice, we see primarily it is the anaerobic environment, especially for flooded fields where methane emissions can be um, a, a big source of greenhouse gas emissions. When we, when we start to look closer on the animal industry, and I use here a figure from a, a recent review focusing on the dairy industry, it does a good job of looking at the emissions by different stages within the animal production cycle. And we see the emissions coming from the animal, from that digestion process as enteric emissions, we also see emissions from the feeding, primarily from energy use for the handling and, and transport of these materials around the farm. We also see direct emissions coming from the housing, regardless of the type of animal housing, free stall or bedded pack or open lot, there are different gases emitted between methane, nitrous oxide and ammonia. And I wanna pause here because even though ammonia, we haven't seen ammonia as a greenhouse gas, there is a path, an indirect path, to get that ammonia gas emissions to nitrous, nitrous oxide, which is the greenhouse gas. So it's uh, an indirect way of uh, greenhouse gas generation. We also see the manure storage phase, whether it's solid, or slurry, or a liquid system, 
Also, we see the method of manure application has an impact as well as the soil management. Another approach, and it's important way when we are trying to do consistent accounting of carbon is to look at what we call an up chain emissions. These are the emissions that happen outside of the farm gate. These are emissions uh, associated with the gasoline that is used to manufacture um, and transport feed, electricity, as well as the resources used to make fertilizer or plastics or machinery. All of these are greenhouse gas emissions, but we call them up chain or pre chain. Basically, they happen before you do anything on a farm. And we distinguish those from the direct emissions, which are directly released from the ag production system that is, the feed production, the animal production, and the manure handling. And we also, as you've seen, how the indirect source of greenhouse gas, like ammonia gas coming um, from manure management and handling. So this framework, this approach is what we call the life cycle. Basically from the entire <clears throat> production chain allows us to do a complete counting and understand the contribution of every part to these greenhouse gases. An example here is from a modeling greenhouse gases on a, green, on a, on a dairy farm and you get to see the relative, it allows us to do two things, to see the contribution of the different practices on the farm, but also allows us to compare a dairy farm in Pennsylvania with one in New York or New Zealand or Idaho. And quickly we can zoom in and realize that the majority of the carbon footprint or emissions of carbon dioxide equivalent units to units of milk produced are primarily coming from the animal enteric emissions and we see the crop and the pasture management. We also see that hatched component on the top of the chart refers to what we call the pre-chain or the up chain, all of the emissions that happen outside of the farm. We see the manure storage has a relative contribution that varies depending on the type of the system we are analyzing. A similar life cycle assessment analysis of the fork industry uh, in the early 2010 has looked at not just what happens inside the farm, but also the entire supply chain. So you see two columns. On the left, the entire life cycle, including the transport, the packaging, and the consumption. And you see about 62 to 65% of that is coming from the live animal production phase. And when we zoom in and look at the column on the right, which is the farm gate total, we see that the manure and the feed almost equal parts responsible for these emissions, as well as the piglets and fuel and electricity associated with the production. So these are really useful approaches to analyze how production or points of intervention. And a prime example that relates to the footprint for pork is when we analyze it based on how manure is managed on farm by farm for the swine industry. And we quickly see that all being equal, the anaerobic lagoons are associated with the higher pounds of carbon dioxide equivalent emitted for every pounds of live weight of animal produced, much greater than what we have the other systems of, of swine manure management, the slurry, the deep pit, or solid storage or pasture even. So clearly these, all of these analyses gives us an idea on all the practices that we can start to employ to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions on a farm. From an animal side, we've recognized immediately that feed additives, especially for our ruminants, to reduce these enteric emissions can be a very important intervention. We also see that formulating the feed rations, not simply for the cost and the nutrient completion, but also for their upstream environmental or emissions can be a very valuable tool to reduce the overall production impacts. We also so see that the manure management can play a big role from simply solid separation and managing the solids separate from the rest of the liquid on the farm, coverage, anaerobic digestion or recovery of the biogas, which our presenters will talk to us about, as well as solids composting or injection of manure. And we see also that even from the manure management side, going to the cropland and between the reduced tillage reducing fertilizer inputs or optimizing the fertilizer use to match crop demand at a very precise rate, including variable, variable rate application, increasing soil ability to store carbon and potentially land retirement if feasible. All of these are approaches <clears throat> can put together to 
reduce the greenhouse gas for our sectors or our industry. And I would like to uh, point out one of the tools uh, as I'm, I'm wrapping up my talk, which is a the, the Comet Farm. This is a tool that the USDA, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, put out as a voluntary tool for both the planners and the farmers to put together a, a, an accounting of the greenhouse gas footprint for a farm and measure the impact of an intervention or a change in management as these measurements are valuable and as our other presenters in this webinar will tell you are the basis of how the carbon markets are run, basically the value of the carbon's emissions that are avoided based on these practices that are put on farm. To sum up, again, greenhouse gas emissions uh, are a potential risk to climate and our ecosystems. Markets, as we'll learn more, are primary mechanisms for managing these. We know that crop and animal agriculture has a role to play and an opportunity for our producers to contribute in these carbon markets. We identified enteric emissions, manure management, and field management as the greatest opportunities for reduction. Calculators and tools are important tools to measure the magnitude of these impacts and get us to that conversation around the economics. And with that, I'd like to thank you.